Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's video. I'm your host, Chase Shooting, and today I am so proud and honored to share with you an incredible conversation with my new friend, multi-level athlete. This guy is about to do his 44th Ironman, and he is a medical doctor. He is a beacon in his community. He's an, an example of what it means to live a life ever forward and the human potential. Definitely want to check out this conversation. Welcome to the show with Dr. David Minkoff. We're going to be talking a lot about the current status of the world, the United States, the whole medical approach, the whole media disillusion of COVID, what is going on, best ways to protect yourself, to boost your immune system, to de decrease all-cause mortality. Uh, and then we get into longevity. We get into what it means to be an Ironman. We get into what it means to take inventory of the things that matter most in your life so that you don't take them for granted, whether that's your fitness and your nutrition, your relationships, your profession. Dr. Minkoff is also the author of The Search for the Perfect Protein, The Key to Solving Weight Loss, Depression, Fatigue, Insomnia, and Osteoporosis. All this information will be listed down in the video notes and the show notes. Don't miss out. If this was impactful for you, you found one piece of valuable information, make sure to share this with a friend. All right, knowledge is too precious to keep to ourselves. Welcome to the show. This is Ever Forward Radio. Three, two, one. Well, Dr. Mikoff, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Ever Forward. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. And thanks for having me here. We were just connecting. Um, you know, I learned that you're in Florida, uh, in which I know when I was kind of glued to the screen for a little while, like I think a lot of uh, the world was the last few months, Florida was was kind of a hot seat for a while. Um, and someone who lives there, works there, and is a medical doctor, what, what's been kind of your personal and professional take on on the Florida situation? Uh, was it really as hype as a lot of the media was making it seem? What was the day-to-day -day life like? You know, how, how did it affect your job? You know, what was kind of your experience with COVID here? Uh, job, we, we, we just worked right through it. Um, our clinic has a lot of people with chronic illness, so we don't, we don't allow anybody who's really sick in here. So if people are screened for COVID, they can't, you know, we don't let them in. We test them before. Um, but our regular clientele, about three quarters of the patients we see come from out of town. Um, most of them have seen an average of 13 doctors and they have, you know, fairly serious medical problems, chronic fatigue, Lyme, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune disease, things like that. Um, and so we have a large clinic here. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest in the United States where we handle people sort of 85% uh, of the time uh, we get it right and people get better. Mm. Uh, see a lot of cancer. So our clientele was, is mostly from out of town. So for a while, uh, a lot of people wouldn't travel, but now it seems like things are opened up pretty well and people are coming. Um, Florida has a lot of older people. So there's a lot of retirees, there's a lot of nursing homes. So I think those, some of those people got hit. Um, governor in Florida has been really pretty much right on everything. He's trying to open it up as much as he can. So, you know, there was a few months where we couldn't go to the beach and it was sort of, sort of terrible. Mm. Um, not what you're used now to. It's, yeah, same huh? thing for, not what you're used to. Same thing for us Southern Californians. You know, you take away the outdoors and the sun and the beaches, things get, can, things can get ugly, right? Right. Exactly. But I think it's calming down and I think we're going to, you know, it, this is so much, it's more politics than it is health and medicine at this point, I think. Um, you know, there's very little evidence that masks help, but everybody's got to wear a mask. Uh, bars are still shut down here because people go to bars and they want to talk to each other and touch each other and they don't like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Schools, you know, one school opened, then it closed. The, the SEC, I guess, is going to play football, but they're trying to find people who they can play with. Uh, the wow. Big Ten isn't going to play football, and the Pac-10 is not going to play football. So it's, you know, it's just, it just, I, I think the, the large companies feel a big pressure from liability, that someone's going to go somewhere, and then they're going to sue somebody. 
because it's their fault that they went and that they got infected. And I think if a net was put over that, like you go there, you're responsible. It's not the, you know, it's not the arena's fault or the stadium's fault or the bar owner's fault. If you went there, you did that on your own determinism and you are responsible for what happens to you, which is really should be the rule of life, I think. But in any case, in this disease, and then people who are vulnerable or who are health compromised should make choices where they protect themselves. And people who don't feel that way, then they take the consequences of what they get. You know, like in Florida, there's no helmet rule for motorcycles. That's right. If you want to wear a motorcycle helmet, you can. And if you don't, you can't. Uh, Or you don't have to. Uh, You do have to wear sunglasses or glasses, eye protection. But Really? uh, That's a requirement, but a helmet isn't? No. Interesting. And most of the deaths from motorcycle are from head injuries. And everybody, I like motorcycles, so I ride motorcycles and I wear a helmet. But there's a lot of guys that ride with no helmets. And that's their choice. And I think that's fine. As long as you don't pick, expect the state to pick up your medical tab from your broken head, mm-hmm. then you can do whatever you want. You know, if you're not hurting someone else, you can live the way you want. You want to take drugs? Okay, take drugs. But it's not my, you know, it's not me or the government that should tell you because that just doesn't work. Then it's my idea versus your idea and I'm right and you're not. And that doesn't go anywhere. I agree. All the major conflicts in the world have been my religion's better than yours or my philosophy. my, My Marxism is better than capitalism or whichever way you want to spin it. And that never gets anywhere except in a fight. How then would you advise, you know, your personal opinion, your professional medical opinion, how then would you advise the listener, um, Americans, human beings of the world to effectively take ownership, take dominion over their health in a way that keeps them safe, but allows them to kind of take inventory of all variables uh, without it turning into this kind of like political dichotomy, if that's even possible? Well, I think if you decide you're responsible for your own condition, for your own health, that there are, you know, there's a, there's, there's a whole cohort of people who have risk factors which make them more susceptible to COVID, cancer, heart disease, uh, and it's quite identifiable. You know, if you're older, so I don't know, 80, 90% of the people who died of COVID were in their, you know, above 78 or something like that, okay? Prescription medication is a risk factor. And I used to be an emergency room doctor. And when my, uh, when the patients would come in the emergency room, the average patient had, was on 12 medications, 12 prescription medications. That's a big risk factor. Diabetes is a big risk factor. Having had a flu shot is a risk factor. Uh, you know, having having shot was a risk factor. 36% increased risk of COVID in an R- U.S. Army study that was looking at this. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So the, uh, you know, being on a certain classes of uh, antihypertensive medications make you more susceptible. So, you know, obesity is a risk factor. So if a person decides that they want to take a health path, then they just have to work out their life so that they don't have those things. Uh, And if they don't know it or don't understand it or don't want to, then their risks are higher. Like not everyone that smokes gets lung cancer, but you have a, I think a 40 or 50% increased chance of lung cancer if you smoke. So, you know, you roll the dice. Uh, uh, if you eat fast food three or four days a week, you up your risk factor. But that food isn't healthy food. So, you know, trying to control 8 billion people, you know, we're going to vaccinate everybody, you know, or you can't go. This is just Janet Napolitano, the, I think she's the provost for the University of California system, just said you can't go to school unless you get a flu shot. Now, that is pretty out there in terms of where is your personal freedom? Where are your 
personal rights. It's government imposing on, on the self, on the body. Yeah, yeah that, that yeah. definitely crosses the line, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, at the end of World War II, there was the, um, the Nuremberg trials. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the Nazis were famous for was medical experimentation mm -hmm. on children and adults. And part of the outcome of the Nuremberg trials was, was this set of guidelines which uh, asserted personal freedom and personal medical freedom. And then no one had the right to make you take a medicine or do a treatment or do something like that to your body if you didn't agree. And then the United Nations has a declaration of human rights. It includes that. And this is just being sort of thrown out the window now across the board in almost every country, you know, to save the save us from this terrible virus, which uh, it's not a nothing virus, but, you know, 600,000 people a year in the United States die from heart attacks. It's largely a preventable condition. I agree. 600,000 people a year die of cancer. It's largely a preventable condition. Nobody cares about that. You know, it's, it, that's why I say, I think politically, this is such a hot football and there's so much, um, you know, money to be gained by one side or the other, or, you know, news organizations and promotion of, you know, merchants of chaos that it just sells. So I think that's the biggest problem. It, so many things there. Um, the the health coach in me inside is like screaming. Someone that um, I no longer do this day to day, but for years, working with in you know with patients, with 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 clients um, in a medical model, and I would see. I, I would kind of have a unique perspective because the clinical environment. I had access to their medical records. Uh, I worked hand in hand with their physician. It was not just, hey, just come to me. Let's give you a workout, build a meal plan. It was all encompassing. And when I would see their labs, when I would see their medical history, when I would see their family history, when I would see, oh, I used to be a smoker or I currently drink 12 Dr. Peppers a day, when I would see all of these other things, it was it was the veil had been lifted and it radically changed how I, I viewed medical statistics, how I viewed my approach to fitness and nutrition. It definitely changed how I went about my recommendations to build a plan and to coach these people because I, I knew that, Hey, honestly, what I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to give you, you know, your workouts, your meals, you know, all these recommendations, it is going to be falling on deaf ears it is going to be one step forward, two steps back if we're not actually addressing all these comorbidities, these chronic illnesses, these diseases that are, we know, to be preventable, treatable, and some even, I would dare say, curable by just lifestyle modifications, by doing less of this, more of that. Right. Would you say that, and kind of to kind of, you know, wrap up the COVID section here, would you say that if there was a heavier focus, and I love we were taking the stance of taking dominion over our own health and our life, but beyond that, do you think our COVID numbers, uh, people's chances of getting it, uh, or the severity of which they have it if they do get it, could be drastically reduced if there was more of a focus on improving your wellness, improving your nutrition, looking at reducing these other all cause, you know, more, more mortalities. There's no question. There's no question. I think back in December, when it was apparent that something was going on in China, there was an epidemic that if U.S. healthcare policy had made a few interventions like this year, don't take your flu shot because it's, it'll put you at increased risk this year, go to your doctor right now and get a vitamin D level in your blood. Because if it's not above, I, my ideal is 70 to 90, but if it's above 50, it's probably okay. Very big factor in immune health and avoiding these kind of illnesses. You know, get on a good food plan where 80% of your food isn't out of a package or a box. You know, it's real. It's a real peach, real broccoli, real piece of meat. Eat real food. 
uh, get some exercise, go outside and get some fresh air and move your body for 20 or 30 minutes a day. It doesn't matter. You can walk, walk, get a dog, walk your dog three times a day. I mean, anything, you know, simple things like that. Uh, take a little zinc and take a little vitamin C and, you know, take some amino acids and take some fish oil. These are some basic stuff. And your and and if you're diabetic, we cure diabetes, literally. Mm. We don't really cure it, but it's a condition of excess oh, yep, yep. in most people, okay? Not type 1 diabetics. Right. But if you just reduce your carbs to less than 25 or 30 grams a day, your diabetes and almost everybody that we treat, it goes away. Your blood sugar, your fasting blood sugar will be under 100. Your hemoglobin A1C will be in the low to middle fives, and you won't have diabetes. So these are things that someone could do. And if you said, look, diabetics die a lot faster with the coming pandemic. You know, if you said this in December. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. you, can, you can correct most people with this. I'm sure you've done this yourself. In six to eight weeks, they can drop 15 or 20 pounds. Oh, yeah. Their blood sugars can come into range. Their hemoglobin A1Cs can go into normal. And all they have to do is you give them a meal plan and just eat this. Yeah. And when you're tempted to, to <laughs> you know, when you're tempted to do something else, okay, now and then you can get away with it. You know, if you're 80% perfect for most people, it works. But... If you did that, and then the, the same, and there's a few drugs that have that are antihypertensives, and if you have, have high blood pressure and you have to take drugs for your high blood pressure to control it, then maybe talk to your doctor about one that doesn't sort of put you at increased risk. And then those things, those are easy. Those are easy. And if you know, if you knew that grandma, grandpa, or you're sitting there at you know 75, 78, 80. These are things that affect you too, and that you can make a big difference by just taking, you know, just taking responsibility for those things or the people who are responsible for you or ultimately U.S. healthcare policy. Like if the campaigns were being run, you yeah. know, if the president and Fauci were on the TV half an hour every night, look, did you take your vitamin D today? You know, did you eat 80% of your food, which was whole and fresh and organic? Yeah. You know, you could transform the whole thing because people are sensitive to the inputs they get and you can brainwash them into good as easy as you can brainwash them into bad. But the whole opposite effect was taken. You're going to die. Don't touch each other. Stay away from each other. Hide yourself in your house. You know, don't go to work. Stress out yourself financially as as much as you can. Yeah. And. Maybe there's going to be a vaccine in a couple of years, though a successful vaccine against this type of virus has never been developed. And I wouldn't hold my, I wouldn't keep my, you know, I wouldn't hold my breath till it actually comes out and that it's actually going to be really tested and really safe because I don't, there's no evidence that that's going to happen. And it, so it still comes back to, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to live and what are you going to take? And, yeah. and it, it's a nanny state. We have a nanny state. You know, but nanny states just, you know, the ultimate nanny state is communist China. OK, they tell you what you can do and what you can't do and where you can go. And they keep track of you every moment. And if we don't want that here, then we got to change our minds about how we're living, because ultimately that's what it comes out. I agree. I, I agree. And that was one of the things that honestly, it took me a little bit of time um, to really kind of catch on and pay attention to these guidelines and recommendations that were coming out for social distancing, for the mask, for, you know, shelter in place. Um, to a certain degree, I agree with some of those, especially when numbers were through the roof and it was just, you know, hey, clearly we need, it's a contagion thing. But then afterwards, I, this is where I was late to the game. I was like, well, why are we not then empowering people and educating people on, okay, how to get healthier, how to infuse the body and mind with things that are going to lower stress, increase your immune system, improve uh, all levels of happiness and wellness and decrease all cause mortalities so that you are, you, you have the greatest fighting chance, not just for this disease, but for all cause mortality for every chronic illness and disease out there. You, you, you just 
you're a warrior. You're a wellness warrior at that point. Where is that education? You know, it's frustrating. Right. You know, it's isolation and disconnection, which is the worst for the human psyche and the human spirit 100%. and the human immune system. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to improve your immunity, hug a hundred people. Okay. Every day that you will improve your immunity. You can feel it. You'll improve your hormone levels. You can feel it. And this whole thing is do the opposite of that. Don't get within six feet of someone, you know, cover your yeah. face, you know, don't shake hands. Don't associate, you know, these, these are the things that make us human and make us alive. Absolutely. And I mean, if you want to create that, mental illness in people, exactly what you do is what's exactly. being done. I was just isolation. Say, the numbers that I have seen beyond, um, you know, any COVID statistic that keeps blowing my mind is the significant and heartbreaking increase of mental health disor disorders and diseases, not only new ones, but ones that were there and were treatable. And then just all of a sudden, I have heard so many stories where people with mental health disorders couldn't literally because of these mandates and things like that could not go to get their medication. Uh, and then their biochemistry um, changes, and then they take their own life, or they slip into a, a very, very dark depression. Um, Dr. Minkoff, I, I actually recently my family, we went through um, a suicide recently, my family, someone who had suffered substance abuse, um, and suffered for years and years and years with depression, mental health disorders, that person put that you put that person in isolation, you disconnect that person from their family, from life from sunlight from connection. Um, it, it was it was horrible. I mean, just it, for that person to get to that point of that's their out. Um, you know, where is the connection? Where is the education? You know, it, it was it was terrible. Um, and my heart goes out to anybody else kind of enduring that right now. But um, to kind you know, of the other aspect of this ahead. is even even people with, with not even people with necessarily with mental health issues, but look at all the all the seniors that are in nursing homes. Their families yeah. can't visit them. And yeah. now there's a big uproar here that, okay, we're going to let you visit them, but you can't touch them. You know, yeah. you can't hug them. You know, this is devastating. It's a look at any, you know, the worst possible thing to a prisoner is solitary confinement. Absolutely. Because it cuts you off. Yeah. And, and, and so I think that is where that thinking of has to be just a lot better on what is really the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And what really, you know, how, how do we orient ourselves around that? Um, I agree. And I that's agree. not being, you know, done very well, in my opinion. There's room for improvement, for sure. Uh, room for improvement in a lot of areas of life. Um, and you are someone who has found room for improvement in a lot of areas of your life, and you have improved them. You have optimized them. Um, not only are you a medical doctor, but an Ironman, an Ironman, uh, an author, uh, someone that has just found ways to optimize your performance, your daily living in so many ways. How did you get there? What were kind of these um, initial rooms for improvement that you latched onto that you even put to the extreme, I'll say, of really testing the human potential in such an event as the Ironman? You know, you just triggered a memory for me that I hadn't thought about in a long time. Oh, yeah. uh, when I was probably <clears throat> fifth or sixth grade, I read sort of a, a child's version of a biography of Albert Einstein. And he made a statement in there like, your average man doesn't use more than 10% of his potential or 10% mm -hmm. of his brain. And, you know, I remember in high school, like, well, how do I fix that? You know, <laughs> how do I use more percentage of my potential or like my challenge brain. accepted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, what does that mean? How does that translate to? And luckily enough, I had a, a mother who wouldn't accept mediocrity from me. Mm. So if I would come home with five A's and one B, the B got all the attention. All right. Like you can do better than that. Okay. <laughs> So I don't know. I guess I accepted that challenge too. And I always tried to excel in whatever I did, partly to please her, I think. Um, <laughs> it's good to also, be happy, right? It, it's usually never a bad thing. Right. Uh, and also just for my own satisfaction that I, you know, there was a goal. The bar was high. I worked as hard as I could. I never minded work. In fact, 
I like work. And it seems for my own, uh, you know, I like things that are hard. Like Ironmans aren't easy. They're hard. Marathons aren't easy. They're hard. But no disagreeing if you, there. <laughs> if, you, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you start to play that as a game, you can just learn a lot about yourself and what your own self-imposed mm-hmm. barriers are and how you can overcome them. And I think how you can expand the amount of self expressed and, and, and what you can create out of it. And that that's, you know, if life is a game and you're put here for some reason, I don't think there's really accidents, that there's a purpose for your life. And if you can figure out what it is, and then you can get that as high as you can, then I, I often think about this, like, you know, you're, you're sitting in your, wheel, in your, not in your wheelchair, in your rocking chair, <laughs> and you've got an hour to go, and then you know that your life is going to end. And you do just a look back on how was it? How did I do? You know, did I get done what I wanted to get done? The two, two big questions on this. Did I accomplish what I wanted to? And were other people happy that I did what I did? Yes. So yes. that's sort of a self thing, but also then a very much broader thing. Mankind, the planet, you know, the pets that I had, you know, was I good at that? You know, did I do, you know, did I meet my own sort of moral standards or my own ethical standards on those things? And so I think I just play that back and forth. Like before I'm going to bed at night, I have a little scale of, you know, the areas that I, that are important to me, like my family and my pets and my business and my patients and my athletics and my diet and things like that. And I just sort of run through this checklist of, I have a one to five scale. So if I did really good in it that day, I get a five. If I did really bad, I get a one, Mm. you know, like I've been married for 51 years. Okay, Amazing. same wow. woman, original girlfriend. We were in kindergarten together. Oh, no so <laughs> it's a long term relationship. Yeah. Okay. But you don't stay married for 51 years unless you sort of figure out how can you keep a relationship fresh and good and exciting. And it takes some effort, you know. So at the end of the day, I look at, you know, wife and say, How did I do today? Did I give her a hug? Did I say something nice? Did I hold her hand? Did I write her a note? Did I text her something interesting? Mm. You know, did I create in that area of my life that day? And when I do, I get a good score. And when I don't, I don't. And if I look and I got three days in a row, I know I'm not getting my job done. And I know it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Huh? If your wife is like mine, she'll let you know that you've been getting. That's right. Months. So, <laughs> so that's a flunk, right? It's yeah. a flunk, yeah. you know? Um, you know, we, we, we walked across the street and you didn't take my hand. Like mm. you're right. You know what I mean? So you can, you can categorize these, you know, like this morning I met my fitness goal. You know, I had a workout planned. I did it. I worked it. It was really good. Tonight, I get to check that box. You know what I mean? Mm. And I think if people sort of look at their, what are their goals and what are the things that they're trying to accomplish in these various areas for yourself, for your family, for sort of your business world, you know, the people that you work with, um, bigger than that, then like mankind, like what's your responsibility for what the hell is going on in this planet with, with people? And then plant life. Animals. I have a couple of dogs. So, you know, oh, great. Yeah. when I'm doing the dogs, you know, when I'm in really good communication with them, like they're really good. And when I'm not, they're, they're, you know, they're jumping all over me and they're doing bad stuff, <laughs> pooping in the house or whatever, you know? Red so flag. I think a person yeah. can, can look at these areas and it's a satisfaction scale, really. And it's, and then, then when you look back, because everybody's going to have this experience, you know, is it regret? Is it wish I would have done, you know, is it, I could have done better. And I just hate that feeling. 
Like for me, that's a, that's the most negative emotion I get. Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. I, I'm with you on that. I literally feel you. Uh, I hate that sensation. It's something that I strive to, to work, to avoid really. Um, I, I love what you're talking about. There reminds me of this phrase that I would kind of use again, um, you know, well, in, in my health coaching practice, but definitely something that sticks with me today for just quality of life is uh, that you can't manage what you don't measure. And when you don't have a measurement, when you don't have a way to kind of take inventory of these things in your life that you that you yourself say, I value this thing, this person, this place, and you don't check in with that. Well, that's when thing, it's a slippery slope to, to kind of begin to take things for granted. To, to lose touch with them, uh, to begin to do just even 1% less, to backtrack a little bit. Next thing you know, it's a month, it's a year, it's a decade later. And then you're like, holy hell, how did I lose touch with this person? How did I lose touch with myself? How did I let myself go? Um, so, I mean, I, I echo 100% what you're saying. It, it takes little time, even just something at the, as minimal as the end of your day or the end of your week or the end of your month, whatever you can make time for to take inventory of and, and to measure, then you can effectively manage. And then boom, there's your quality of life going through the roof for sure. Right. Right. When you were going through, you know, training, particularly for your Ironman, um, what, what new things maybe about yourself did you discover when you were taking inventory of your training, when you were pushing the, the human envelope, when you were, you know, going one more, uh, more than you thought you ever could. Um, I've been in those circumstances. I'm not an Ironman or run a marathon, but my military days, you know, I've put 80 pounds on my back and rucked, you know, 10, 20 miles. You're really surprised at what you can do. And then like that opens up kind of the floodgates of just the self and your thoughts and just life. What did Ironman training, what did that accomplishment and those grueling endurance days teach you more about yourself than maybe you were expecting? I think mostly that just like life, things are up and down. They're not always stable. It doesn't always feel good. You didn't always do the right thing. But if you can hang in there and keep going, you know, sometimes in an Ironman, I've done 43 Ironmans. 43? So, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Wow. Uh, I'm very, I think you're probably the most <laughs> insane person I've ever talked to. <laughs> That's impressive. I have one in two months. If they're going to have the race, I'm ready for it. So wow. it'll be 44. Wow. No, it's really, it's, it's, it's school, you know, it's school. And you just, you just learn what you, what your, what your, what you thought were your limits. You know, I don't know if you've seen or read David Goggins book or, Oh, I'm re-listening to the audible version now uh, for the yeah. time. Yeah. So I think his comment is right. When you think you're done, you're only 30% done. You know, if you had to do it to live, you know, if the penalty was they're going to chop off your hand, if you didn't take another, if you couldn't go another mile, most guys would suck it up and they'd go another mile. Mm -hmm. And finding that place, you know, that self-determined turnoff point, one of the things that's interesting in, in athletic training is that the brain will shut down before the, the, the cardiovascular system or the muscular system will shut down. The brain will, will perceive that future of this will, could be catastrophic and Most we're going to end it early. Yeah. And that isn't really true because you throw some amino acids and some salt and potassium, some other stuff in there. And then, all of a sudden, the brain gets a different idea that, well, that wasn't really an accurate uh, perception of what was going to occur. And then you get more. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's learning that about, you know, you and it applies everywhere. You know, it so applies cool. across the board. It's uh, funny you say that. I just brought down there's this, this uh, product that uh, is new to me. I'm trying out now. It's called Element. Uh, I just pulled this out. I was going to add it to my water uh, for some rehydration. I'm testing out a new product as well. And you're talking, you know, add some amino acids, add some of these minerals and salts. Um, I'm about to be adding some salt, citric acid, mag magnesium, malate, potassium chloride, and some stevia. Uh, I'm getting about a thousand milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Um, you're an iron man. Tell me, Am I doing my body justice here? Is this good? There's a much better energy? product if I can if I can toot my own horn. Okay, all right, school me. 
So I have a, I have a nutrition company called Body Health. Mm -hmm. And um, the amino acid products that we make are the best in the world. There's nothing close to them. It's a product called Perfect Amino. If you're, if you're into athletics and training and bodybuilding or endurance sports or health, um, this is a product that everyone should take. Um, I wrote a book called The Search for the Perfect Protein. That's right. Uh, if you go to bodyhealth.com, you can download it free. It's really a good book. It's an Amazon bestseller. But we, I created a uh, electrolyte replacement drink for myself. Mm. And um, it's a mixture of sodium and potassium. It's got a lot. The, your product doesn't have enough potassium in it. Okay. Uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, zinc. And what would be an uh, ideal blend you're looking for? What, what are the numbers that, you're, that you would like? Uh, what we have is 150 sodium, 100 potassium. Um, um, we have less magnesium. I think there's 35 magnesium. And then trace elements. So there's plus zinc, like 15 milligrams of zinc. Oh, excellent. And then, Great immune booster. And then, and then two grams of, uh, of the perfect amino. It's an eight essential amino acids. And I tell you, so we have a lot of athletes that use the product, like thousands, tens of thousands. And the feedback on that is just extraordinary. And it's the same for myself. Like Saturday, I rode 60 miles. Um, it was very hard. It was with a group. It's really hot here now. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, the, the perceived temperature is like 112. So oh. that's like 95 degrees and 95% humidity. So you're with 20 guys and the guys at the front always are pushing it. And so I, I, I had, we make a really delicious uh, food bar, like two of them, like they're really good and they won't raise your blood sugar. Oh, really? Um, wow. It really, yeah. It's a body health bar. There's a chocolate brownie and there's a, a blondie and I use a, no glycemic you know, I, use a load. I use a CGM Okay. Yeah. and I track my sugar with everything I do and my sugar doesn't go up maybe five points with a bar. It's 240 wow. calories. It's really good. So I had a bar and then I rode for three and a half hours, very hard. All I had was two scoops in two water bottles and I was completely fine. It's really good. We have a, we have a pro athlete in, um, in Palm Springs and she's training. It's 130 degrees there now, I think, or, or can get up that high. There's been a heat wave in uh, Southern California the last couple of weeks too. It's funny, actually on the news the other day, I've never had, I've never seen a meteorologist have to explain humidity. Uh, I'm from Virginia. I'm from the East Coast. We get it. But he had to actually spend time to say, this is the temperature, but it's going to feel like this because of humidity. Humidity right. is blah, blah, blah. I was like, wow, this is a first for Southern California, apparently. <laughs> he actually has to explain humidity. But yeah, right. it, we're, we're losing so much uh, more than usual um, through sweat, through daily living, and then through exercise. Absolutely. Right. Anyway, so the product is, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to send you some to try. It's really, uh, thank you. It, it's, it's really good. And I, the amino acid addition to the, to the electrolytes, I think really makes a difference. There's a, I think it affects the brain in a way that, like I was talking about before, the brain doesn't feel, there's a certain kind of stress it feels if there's too much protein breakdown during exercise and just trickling in those amino acids seems to make a difference because I'm hearing it. You know, from the guy, you know, we, we piloted it with about 50 of our sort of elite athletes and they virtually all came back, you know, and they, they're not paying them. They're just, they, they like to try stuff uh, and they really feel a difference. Um, so uh, anyway, um, I'll get you some and you try right. it and see how it works for you. Oh, I would love to. Thank you so much. Um, you're hitting on a key term that is no stranger to me. And honestly, uh, professionally speaking, I'll say that it's usually kind of a, a hot topic. People are, think it's a total waste of money. Uh, people think uh, it's it's God's gift to to training and recovery. Amino acids, amino acids, branch chain amino acids. Um, so many different schools of thought of this is great for you. It's good for intra workout, for recovery, for just getting immediate, you know, protein profiles to your muscles to for mostly for recovery and protein synthesis. But then other people will say it's a waste of money. It's useless. W which one's right? You know, what's your, what's your experience here with amino acids? Well, I think branch chain amino acids are actually a waste of money. I don't okay. think they do anything. There's no good science on branch chain amino acids. They do spare muscle, but it's only because your body's going to turn those branch chain amino acids into a carbohydrate and you're going to have some fuel rather than breaking down your own muscle for fuel. You can use those. So I, I, I think that that's a, it's, it's an industry, but I don't think there's any science to it. 
Okay. Um, and then what's the difference between the things, chain and the amino acids you're talking about? Yeah, because there, there's eight essential amino acids, which include three branch chains. So leucine, isoleucine, valine, but then there's five more essential amino acids. And if you don't get all five at the same time when you eat in the right balance, most of the amino acids don't get utilized to make your own body protein. Mm. So if people are interested in it, they should look at the book because there is this, there is a, you can calculate, you can actually do an experiment of let's say my only protein source for the day is going to be whey protein, mm. just as an example. So you eat fruits and vegetables all day. Um, you get some calories from that. There's very little usable amino acids in fruits and vegetables. So ne there's negligible protein in fruits and vegetables. Sure. But um, you're going to say, okay, my daily requirement for protein is, let's say, 100 grams. I'm going to eat 100 grams of whey protein. And then you measure, you can measure nitrogen in and out. So what makes a protein a protein is it has nitrogen, whereas carbs and fats don't have nitrogen. So in 100 grams of whey protein, there is about 16 grams of nitrogen available. Now, if the body's going to utilize all that nitrogen and make body structure, so you're going to make muscles, tendons, ligaments, neurotransmitters, hormones, all the various stuff that, that proteins are made, you know, that our body's made out of, then whatever nitrogen gets utilized in the body as part of a protein or an enzyme, it's not going to be eliminated. It's not going to be urinated out. Hmm. So if you say, okay, I'm going to take in 16 grams of nitrogen on that day, and better to do it like three or four days. The, the experimental study was for a month, but let's say you do it for a couple of days. So you say, I took in 16 grams of nitrogen. I'm going to collect my urine for 24 hours. And you can send a urine to LabCorp and ask them to measure how much nitrogen came out in the urine. Because our main our main method of getting rid of excess nitrogen or non-utilized nitrogen, because nitrogen okay. is a waste product for our bodies, is to pee it out. So 90, probably 6% of the nitrogen leaves through the urine. So if you do that experiment with whey protein, what you will find is that 86%, I'm sorry, 84% of the nitrogen that you took in came out. Wow. You didn't make protein out of that. You made you made a carb plus nitrogen. Now the carb you can burn. Okay. Interesting. And the nitrogen is a waste and it came out. Now, if you look at soy and dairy, any dairy protein, it's about 16 or 17 percent. If you look at meat and fish, it's about 33 percent retained. So it's twice as good as dairy or uh, or soybean. Whole eggs are the highest, the second highest. They're about 48%. So if you want the best protein source that you can have as a recovery meal, or if you're a bodybuilder and you're building, it's egg plus yolk, white plus yolk. If you could get breast milk, it's even better. It's 49%. Wow. wow. That's hard to get. Okay. Sure, yeah. Unless you, unless you know a girl, right? <laughs> unless you know a girl. <laughs> yeah. A recently delivered girl. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's got extra? Um, the vegetable proteins run under 10. Spirulina is like zero to 6%. So not very good. This product, Perfect Amino, which I'm talking about, is 99% utilized. So you put in uh, 10 grams of amino acids, 99% of it is going to stay in. Less than 1% is going to come out in the urine. Makes it very powerful. Amazing. So if you're trying to recover or you're trying to build, or what, here's what we found is that I measured amino acid levels in thousands of fasted patients. All the sick patients are very low in serum levels of amino acids, mm. especially essential amino acids. Interesting. They're all deficient. Mm. I've tested many elite athletes. I've worked with a lot of elite athletes, triathletes and Tour de France riders and most of them are low. And when you give them perfect amino as a supplement to an already good diet, they normalize their serum amino acid levels and they tell you that the recovery is much faster. They're, if they're looking for a strength athlete, if they're looking for strength gain or for 
bulk gain, you see a huge difference. And if you go on our website, bodyhealth.com, you can find there's hundreds of testimonials about the effects this had in people. And so I started using it in my practice and then I, I, I used it in myself first because I'd gotten injured. I was a, I was a vegetarian triathlete. Okay. For wow. many years. Not that many of those out there, uh, or at least right. not, not one. No, and I, you know, I, <laughs> right. So this is about 10, 12 years ago. And um, I got injured. I, 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 I tore a hamstring. I didn't really tear it, but I strained it badly and I could not get it to. I've been there. I, I couldn't. I, and I did everything like I chiropractored and massaged and acupunctured and injected. And I did everything. I couldn't get it to stably heal. I go to the track. I try to do a hard set of quarters. I couldn't do it. I would feel it. I knew that if I just kept going, I was going to injure it. Anyway, I started experimenting with mixtures of amino acids and I ran, I got this blend of amino acids and in six weeks, my hamstring was healed. Really? And I went and did, I did Ironman Canada. I'd done it 11 times before I did it my best time ever. And my, 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 uh, uh, Maximum heart rate, which was something that I, I would keep track of, you know, it was 174 for years and years and years. And once I got this, these amino acids in me, my maximum heart rate went up to 186. Okay. So I got better pumping. performance. Yeah, you're pumping. Wow. Pumping. Yeah. So, um, so it's a, it's, it can really make a difference. And I think for a lot of people, they have no idea that amino acids can make a huge impact in their health. Um, and they're not expensive and they can be added to anybody's program. They don't interact with any kind of medication. So they're safe to give them everybody, you know, women will call up and say, you know, I used to have to get my hair done every six weeks and now my hair's growing out in four weeks. And I, I'm mad at you because now I have to spend more <laughs> money on my hairdresser, you know, or my yeah. fingernails are now good or my anemia is now finally corrected or whatever it is. So I think they can have a huge impact. In, in your professional opinion, is the delivery method, does that play as important of a role? Uh, Because I know a lot of people, you can get it in a powder, get it in a mix, your products, uh, there's amino oils that people put on foods when they cook and stuff like that. Does delivery mechanism matter as much? Uh, Does it get broken down or less bioavailable once it's heated up? What what, what would be the best kind of method here? No, I mean, these are, these are L form 99% pharmaceutical grade amino acids. They're already, you know, they're pre-digested, so to speak. So, okay. Um, you get the best cloud if you take them with water, juice, or sports drink on an empty stomach. Uh, we have both, we have two flavors of powders and we have actually just tablets, which are packed powder. There's no, there's no, you know, there's nothing in there except amino acids. So if people like to take tablets better, they're a little dry because they're not, there's nothing in there except amino acids. I prefer the powders, two scoops of powders, 10 grams of amino acids. There's some stevia in there and there's a berry flavor and a lemon lime flavor. And most of what we sell is in that form, but it's, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't, you get less if you eat like a steak dinner and then you take the amino acids because they're going to kind of get lost. Mm -hmm. So what I say, and what I do is when I wake up in the morning, I just put two scoops in a glass of water, add the water, drink it down. I wash up, shave, do that stuff. And then in 23 minutes, they're in your bloodstream. So then if you're going to have breakfast or eat, they're already gone and they're there. Okay. The other interesting thing about these is, and is that they do not raise insulin levels and they do not raise blood sugar levels. If you're on a ketogenic diet, they are neutral. And you can't get that with whey protein or a piece of meat or anything else. They are going to get turned into carbs. They're going to raise your insulin. They're going to raise your blood sugar levels. And these things are very unique in that they don't do that. That's powerful stuff. Um, that's powerful stuff. Uh, we're getting towards the end here. Definitely going to have all of your information for the book, for the products, and uh, your incredible you know, iron man journey down in the show notes for everybody but uh where would be the best place to send somebody to learn more about you your work and you know all the incredible power behind protein and amino acids so for the nutrition part of it my company is called bodyhealth.com there's uh, hundreds of videos on there lots of information on the products that we make um the we're on instagram same body health optimized okay and uh, facebook um my clinic is called LifeWorks Wellness Center. It's a little bit too long, but that's the name. So it's LifeWorksWellnessCenter.com. Uh, also, there's hundreds of videos on there. And then if someone's interested in becoming a patient, um, they can 
you know, they can sort of snoop around and see what we do. Uh, they can call somebody on the phone and talk to them. Uh, those are the two major places. I have a site, drminkhoff.com, so there's some stuff on there too. Um, and like I said, the book is free. If you go to bodyhealth.com, you can download a, okay, great. A, a, you know, a PDF version of it. And um, it's really, I think it's, it's eye-opening to most people who are interested in fitness or performance. Definitely. I, I always enjoy, you know, kind of going back to, you know, I call it basics for me, a lot of things that I studied in higher education and in my clinical practice, but it's always good to revisit these things to just to get a reminder of what the human body does, uh, how we can improve it, how we can optimize it. And I mean, you, sir, are an incredible model of what is possible in longevity. I mean, to, to do dozens and dozens of these Ironman and just, you know, still be be kicking it and ready to go for another one, you know, despite uh, everything going on in the world and despite, you know, anything. I mean, you're still out there just like, let me go one more. Let me push a little bit further. Let me, let me take inventory of my life and just keep getting better one day at a time. Retirement is for sissies. So <laughs> excellent. Well, Dr. Totally. Mink, uh, the, uh, the last question I ask everybody here, kind of keeping all this stuff in mind of human optimization of our fitness, our nutrition, our mindset, um, total wellness. We do these things so that we can live a life ever forward. What does that mean to you? How would you say that you, sir, live a life ever forward? Well, you know, I think if you look in nature or practically anything you do, there is a cycle of action. You know, there is a start, there is a change, and there is a stop. There is birth, there is life, and there is death. I think too many people get this attitude or assume this attitude that when they're in the life part of it, that the birth part of it is over and gone. And that if you can stay sort of in terms of your activity and your own sort of psychology, at the birth side of it, that you keep creating, you know, you keep making it new, you keep exploring, you keep learning, you keep trying new things. Then you just push your life forward the whole time. I think when someone decides that they're 60 and they're old and they're gonna retire and then they're gonna enjoy their life, that they've really missed a whole lot. And they'll miss a whole lot of potential that they could have had. Like I'm working a 60 hour week right now. I could not be happier. And I'm Ironman training and I have eight grandchildren and I have, you know, a wife of 51 years and I, and I'm writing a, you know, a second book and I have two more that are sort of in outline form. Because if you stay on this forward creating edge, and I'm learning things all the time, I spend a lot of time in, in literature and research and going to meetings and talking to other innovators of where is the next edge, where is the next discovery, that it keeps life fresh, very interesting, and that you have way too much to do, and you sort of never run out of things to do, then you don't run out of time. And at some point it will end, but I will be surprised, but I won't regret that up until the end, I ran it. You know, it's sort of an over the ramparts charge at life. That's where the satisfaction is. And if you live that way, you can experience that. So that would be my message. I love that. That's probably one of my favorite answers I've heard in a long time. Um, living ever forward, if we kind of stop forgetting that we, were, we can still be in this birth phase of just constant renewal of constant refreshment. Um, I mean, then, yeah, we're, we're always going to be just moving forward because if we're rebirthing our, our mindset, our approach to life, I mean, everything every day, then like from birth, everything else after that moves forward. So it's kind of, it's, it's a win-win. It's incredible. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, Dr. Minkoff, thank you again so much for your time, your expertise. Crush it at your next Ironman. I hope that they, uh, you know, allow you guys to get out there and your training goes to great use. Um, can't wait to share this out. Thank you for your expertise and your time, sir. Thank you. A lot of fun. Enjoyed it. Yeah.